heart and in my heart. And I don't know about you, but there are times that you can have a habit that's so real and so strong in your life that you literally begin asking the question, does God have enough power to really change me? Can I actually get my life so in harmony with the revealed will of God according to his word that Jesus can actually say to me one day, well done, good and faithful servant. And I don't know about you, but I'm realizing that the devil's really attacking God's people's minds. Um, while sickness and disease and problems with money and all of these things are happening, the devil's target point is the mind. He really wants to get access to your mind and get access to my mind because the devil understands something that the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that as a man thinks in his mind, so is he. And so if Satan can get access to our mind, he knows we cannot help but to reflect his character and his will. That's, that's the reason Jesus said to those Jewish brothers so long ago, a verse that really startled my mind. And I just want to give this to you before we have one more prayer. Jesus said something to his fellow brothers, his Jewish brothers. And this verse never hit me so hard until recent years. One day Jesus was talking to all of his brothers and they kept telling Jesus that they were Abraham's children. And they were very proud of it. We're Abraham's children. And it got to a point that one day Jesus had to show them or tell them who their father really was. And Jesus said in John 8 and verse 44, he said, you are of your father, the devil. And then he said this, and this is the part that really got to me. And the lusts of your father, you will do. If God is not your father, then by default, Satan is. And whatever Satan, you ever said something like, I'll never do that. You ever said that to somebody before? Oh, I'll never do that. Let me tell you something right now. If God, the creator of heaven and earth, if he is not your father, then by default, the devil is our father. And Jesus, he did many things on this earth, but the one thing Jesus never did was tell a lie. And Christ says, if the devil is your father, the lusts, the desires of your father, you will do. And so I believe we're living in a time where the devil is trying to adopt us. He's trying to get you and I to either walk away from God or stay under his tutelage. And in either one of those efforts, at the end of the day, God is here to deliver, to heal, and to bless. And so every message that I will be sharing with you of the five times that I will have the privilege of speaking with you, the Lord has made very clear what he wants to be covered with his people. And you're going to find that what we're going to cover is going to hit the heart, it's going to hit the home, it's going to hit the church, it's going to hit every dynamic of our lives. Because God really wants us to be truly converted. And so as we prepare our hearts to go through this study, I'm going to have one more word of prayer. And I'm going to kneel to do that. And so I'm just going to ask you to please bow your heads with me. And uh, if, you, if you're inclined to kneel, you can kneel with me. If you're okay with it, I'm okay with it. Otherwise, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are truly grateful for this opportunity that we might come together as brothers and sisters to study your wonderful words of life. And Lord, we're just praying at this time that you will please forgive us of our sins, but that you'll also grant us the gift of heaven, your Holy Spirit. We pray that he would come and that he would minister to our hearts. We all have needs, Father, and you know every single one of them, and not only do you know them, you know how to supply solutions to them. And so we come before you with heads bowed and some of us upon our knees, and we're just praying, please, do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. Open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your word. And we do ask all of these blessings 
In the worthy and mighty name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and it's a very powerful statement made in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul wanted to provide comfort to those who were in affliction. Individuals who have done wrong, and in doing wrong, they, you know, when you do something wrong, you want to be forgiven, don't you? You know, that's something we can all relate to. We've all done something wrong, and when we do something wrong, we want to be forgiven. We want to have the assurance to know that though I might have done something wrong, that I am forgiven. I'm pardoned for that thing that I did wrong. Well, there was a brother in the midst of the brethren in the church of Corinth. And Paul got wind of some of the problems that was happening with this brother. And Paul began to give counsel to the brethren in the church of Corinth of the importance of making it known forgiveness. When Paul began to walk through this, he started to go ahead and speak to them. And I'll go ahead and write, start in verse 3. The Apostle Paul says, And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Verse 5. But if any have caused grief... He hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him, and do what else? And comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Verse 8, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him, For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Now watch this. Paul is making it clear that there has been an offense. And in the midst of this offense, Paul says, I didn't allow it to allow me to get overcharged with anger. Paul says, I'm writing this letter unto you because I don't want to simply make you aware of what I'm going through. I want to make you aware of what the will of God is and what you should do towards this brother who has obviously committed an offense. And the thing that he wanted them to do to the brother was what? Forgive him. Forgive him. Give him the assurance because Paul was concerned. I don't want him to be over much sorrow. In relation to that, you ever been so guilty, you ever felt so guilty about the wrong decision that you made that you can take it a little bit too far? You can begin putting a judgment upon yourself that puts you in the position of God. I know people who have put themselves in hell before God did. They began to say, I've done so much wrong, there's no way that God could forgive me. I am hell bound when God says, no, actually, you're heaven bound. And so it is, Paul says, make it known to the brother that not only you forgive him, but let him know I also forgive him for what he's done. That's a, that's a comforting statement, isn't it? But what would happen if the brethren didn't do it? Well, verse 11 kicks in now. So it says in verse 11, lest, in other words, if you don't do this, something's going to happen. What does Paul say in verse 11? He says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us if they did not forgive the brother paul says what would have what would happen with satan as it relates to the rest of them satan would get an advantage over them he'd be able to overtake them and get them to do his bidding which by the way is not forgiving so paul makes it clear make sure you do this lest if you don't do it satan's going to end up getting an advantage over us now How did Paul know that? What does the close of the verse say? It says, for we are not 
ignorant of his devices. One of the great reasons why Paul was so powerful in his ministry, one of the reasons why the wonderful little book called Education, written by Ellen White, where she actually likens Paul, and she says that next to the man who spake as never a man spake. Now, if you don't know who that is, you'd go back to John chapter 7, and you'll find out. The man who spake as never a man spake was none other than Jesus. Ellen White says, next to the man who spake as never a man spake, the most illustrious teacher this world has ever known was the Apostle Paul. Now, you know why that's deep? Paul had to be dead for that to be stated. Because you know why? It's hard to hear a statement like that without getting a little puffed up. So Paul had to be dead before that statement through inspiration could be said. Because you know why? That was not Ellen White that said that. Ellen White was just the penman. The writings of Ellen White is what today we call the testimony of Jesus. Can you imagine that Jesus said, next to me, the most illustrious teacher the world has ever known was Paul. Jesus held Paul in such a high esteem. Now, why is it that Paul was so powerful? Well, one of the reasons why, you just read it. Not only was he anointed of the Holy Ghost, not only was he thoroughly educated, and the list goes on, but one of the reasons why Paul was so powerful, he said, because I'm not ignorant of Satan's devices. Family, I'm here to let you know if you're going to make it through the final scenes of earth's history, if we're, no, if we're going to know how to stand true to God during the closing scenes of the investigative judgment, if we are going to be counted amongst that Revelation 2.10 group that are faithful unto death, that we may receive our crown of life. There is no way that we're going to get that crown, and there is no way that we're going to be faithful up until the end unless we too become aware of Satan's devices. I want to give you a message that's going to touch your mind, make you search your heart, and cause you to make a decision to be on better standing ground with God. We are very much in a war. We did not ask to be in it. We did not sign up for it. But the very fact that you and I choose Jesus, by default, you are in a war. And as a result of that, you have only one or two choices. And in truth, in my mind, I don't even have these two choices, but I'm going to say it respectfully for you because I respect your choice. But we have one of two choices. Again, in my mind, I don't even have two choices. I only have one choice. But respectfully you, for you, I'll say you have one of two choices. You're in a war. Nothing you can do about that. You're going to have to just kind of accept that fact. But you got one of two choices. Win or lose. For me, losing is not an option. And that's why I only have one choice. And for me, that choice is to win. But I respect the fact that if you say, well, I choose to lose. Well, I think that's a terrible choice. But I respect the fact that if that's the choice you made, then that's the choice you have a right to make. But I would like to encourage you, choose to win. Now, if you're going to win, Jesus said something in Luke 14. Let me show you. In Luke 14, if you're going to win, once you accept the fact that you're in a war, once you accept that, that as a result of me standing for Jesus, I have invoked the wrath of Satan and any of his followers. Because of that fact, I'm in a war. And so you can either choose to win or choose to lose in this war. If you choose to win, watch the second witness to what we just read in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. In 2 Corinthians 2, 11, we just saw, if we're going to win, we must become acquainted with his devices. We have to. It is imperative that we understand the movement of God. It is imperative that we understand the righteousness of God. It is imperative that we understand the truth of God, no doubt. But in addition to that, we must understand Satan's devices. 
That's one of the reasons why the Bible reveals it for us to understand it. Now, watch the second witness, Luke 14. In Luke, the 14th chapter, Jesus made the same exact point again. He was talking about the qualification for disciples. And when he was talking about the qualifications for disciples, Jesus got to a point in Luke 14 that here is what he said. And it's very, very powerful. The Bible says this in Luke 14, right there in verse 31. And notice that the language is the language of warfare. It says in Luke 14 and verse 31, or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Are you following that thought? Do you see how Jesus says an intelligent king never enters a war without understanding his enemy? Do you understand that that's literally what Jesus just brought out in Luke 14? You never go into a war because any person who goes into a war is going to need artillery. You're going to have to have some things that you're going to use in that war to ensure you win. But how can you know if you got enough unless you first understand what your enemy has? So that's what Jesus said. What king? He's asking it almost like it's a silly thing to even think otherwise. He said, what king goes to a war and doesn't sit down first and say to himself, do I have enough artillery to go against my enemy? My enemy might have more than me. I think I need to be sure what my enemy has so that way I can make sure I have what I need to succeed against my enemy. Do you see how we have a second witness? Christ wants to make it clear. We're in a war. We can't do anything about it. We didn't ask to get in it. I understand that. I didn't ask either, but we're in it. And so now we either have the choice to win or lose. But for us, we understand there's too much at stake to lose. Losing is not an option. Therefore, we must win. But if we're going to win, Jesus says, then you need to understand some things about your enemy. You Got to understand it. Now, I can assure you, during our five sessions, this being one of them, during our time together, Oh, the man Christ Jesus is going to be so lifted up. I love lifting him up. I love talking about him. I love studying him. And I desire more than anything else to reflect him to those I come in contact with. So please don't misunderstand my statements like we're going to have some study time together where we're just going to glorify the devil and understand all these deep things about him. No, that's not the mission of what I'm here for. What I'm telling you is that there are some things that is very essential for us to understand because we are in a war and we need to get an idea of what the enemy is really trying to do. I'm going to put a verse up on the screen that I know you have read before. And I'm so sorry that, you know, the lighting is not the best, but I tested it and you should be able to see some of this. So this is Proverbs 16 and verse 18 for those of you taking notes. Proverbs 16 and verse 18 makes a very profound statement that you'll understand it more and still more as we go throughout our study. The Bible makes it very clear. Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. Now, if any of you have ever done Bible study, uh, and when I say Bible study, I'm not so much talking about just sitting down and teaching people the Bible, but if you've ever gone through like classes on how to study the Bible, any of you ever been through that before? You went through a class on how to study the Bible? All right. So for those of you who have gone through that, then the word I'm about to use shouldn't be foreign to you if you had a fairly decent teaching. There is a way that you can study the Bible, and one of the ways that you'll see is that there's a way you can arrive at Bible truth through something called parallelism. Okay? Parallelism. What is parallelism? It's very simple. It is the expression of one point or the making of one point, but expressing it in two or more ways. Example, you remember when David committed sin with Bathsheba? He goes to God and he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Remember when David said that? He was making one point. I'm dirty and I need to be clean. That was the one point, but he expressed it in two ways. 
Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Same point. You follow that? All right. Do you know parallelism is in this verse right here? Notice the parallel. Pride goes before what? Destruction. All right. Then it says, and an haughty spirit. So what is haughty spirit being parallel to? Pride. Very good. And then it says, before a fall. So what is fall being parallel to? Destruction. You got that? So pride comes before a fall that leads to destruction. That's a biblical fact. Now, the reason why this is important is because in the beginning of time, we should know, maybe we don't know, but the Bible says in Revelation 12 that there was a war in heaven. There was a war that took place in heaven. There was a rebellion that a being by the name of the devil and Satan, well, at the time he was still called Lucifer, but he became the devil and Satan. And notice the language that Isaiah uses in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. It says, how art thou what? Fallen. Now remember, we just looked at that word fall. When somebody falls in a spiritual sense, we know it's going to lead to what? Destruction. So it says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? What was the foundation of Lucifer's fall that was going to lead to his destruction. Notice the rest of the verses. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. So what we're seeing is a fall that took place with Lucifer. What was the foundation of the fall? Pride. Pride, a self-exaltation. And remember, so we're looking even through the experiences of Lucifer and many others thereafter, we're going to see that, man, that verse that what we just read is serious, isn't it? Because pride always comes before a fall. Now, the rebellion started with Lucifer in heaven, right? Well, let's take it a little further. In Revelation 7 and verse 11, it was understood that angels were to be submissive to God as it relates to him and his throne, and that whoever stood on the throne was the one worthy of worship. Because the Bible says in Revelation 7 and 11, and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces, and they worshiped God. God, whoever sat on the throne received worship. So when the devil says, I'm going to exalt myself on this throne, what he was trying to do was remove God and take his place to receive worship that belonged to him. This is what pride caused Satan to do, to stand in the place of God himself, to try to dethrone God and put himself on the throne that now he is worshipped as if he's God. Don't lose this point. I asked the question, I said, what kind of group am I, am I coming to speak with? You know, you know that ministers, when we come to a certain group of folks, we're supposed to prayerfully inquire, like, what kind of group are we coming before? And, you know, like, what, what is it that God would want us to say? And we need to adapt our messages according to the group. So in my prayer, I was like, Lord, what do you want me to talk about? So he gave it to me. So I said, oh, well, I guess, uh, I guess this is going to be the group I'm going to be dealing with. And that's what God did with me before I arrived. When I arrived, I then had some questions. And when I asked the questions and was told about the kind of group that I have the privilege of being with, I said, well, praise the Lord. God confirmed what he told me. So I said, well, all right, second witness. Wonderful. Now, here it is that I'm walking through things that I'll call fundamental Bible teaching. And because I'm going through fundamental Bible teaching, some of you can finish the verses before I even finish quoting it. And that's good. Because you know what that tells me? That means that you know. That's good. You know. It's wonderful. It's nice to talk to a group that knows. 
But I also know that the Bible says to him that knows to do good, but they don't do it. It says to him it is sin. I am not here to find out how much you know. I'm here for one thing. I'm here to challenge you. What are you doing with what you know? That's what I'm here for. I'm not here to find out how much you know. I'm here to ask you, what are you doing with what you know? The same way God asks me every day, Dwayne, what are you doing with everything that you know? So just stick with me. Don't worry. We're going on a very powerful journey. The Bible makes it very clear. If we're going to succeed in this war, we must understand Satan's devices. We have looked at a powerful biblical principle. Pride comes before falls, which leads to destruction. We're studying now the first fall that ever took place in the Bible. And it started with a being known as Lucifer. And Lucifer fell because of pride. And that pride caused him to want to remove God from the throne and put himself on the throne so he could receive what normally comes to the one that sits on the throne. According to Revelation 7:11, what comes to the one that sits on the throne? Worship. Don't lose that. Well, we know the story that the Bible makes it very clear that Satan did not win. And Satan should have known that he wasn't going to win because angels already knew that they are not worthy of worship. You'll remember that John the Revelator himself had contact with an angel. Remember that? The Bible says in Revelation 22, 8 and 9, it says, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me that these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. The angel made it clear. Angels knew we are not worthy of worship. But we have a fallen angel who forgot his true education, and he wanted to remove God so now he could be worshipped. Well, the Bible tells us very clearly that unfortunately, or fortunately, Satan was removed from heaven. But he landed somewhere, didn't he? Rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, because the devil's come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. So when he came down to earth, he told this lie. Now, I want you to pay attention to the lie, because there was a purpose behind the lie. You and I, if we did tell a lie, didn't you have a purpose behind it? Wasn't there something you were trying to make come to pass through that lie? Well, so it is with Satan. And I want you to see what Satan did. I don't want you to just see the lie that he taught. I want you to see the purpose behind the lie. Watch carefully. Satan lost the battle in heaven. Now he's on earth. Now that he's on earth, he is on a very similar mission. Notice. In Genesis 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Very true. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Now, that was part of the lie, but it went a little bit further. You shall not surely die. But then he says, For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the enticing point that Satan used to get Eve and ultimately Adam to buy into his deception was pride. You'll be exalted. If you do what I tell you to do and disobey what God tells you to do, you'll be exalted to a higher existence. Self-exaltation is the foundation of why sin came into this world. How do we know that? Because when he said you shall be as gods, literally the word God is Elohim. So when he said you shall be as gods, remember in the beginning with the war in heaven, Satan's mission was to dethrone God, sit on the throne so he could be worshiped as God himself. Now, he takes the same thought process and he introduces it to Eve. And he says to her, you shall be like the supreme God himself. In your disobedience, 
you'll be like him. He's trying to fulfill his desire through the people. Are you following that? Pretty fundamental so far. Don't lose it. So here it is that when the devil came down on this earth, and now woe unto us indeed, because he's definitely coming to us with great wrath. But he's coming to us with a plan. His plan is that he wants to fulfill his desire through you and to fulfill it through me. And he started with our first parents on this earth. Here it is that along with that, the Bible also starts showing that even through kingdoms, the same exact mission of Satan. The Bible says in Genesis 10, 8 through 12, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Ichad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. So notice that now Nimrod's on the scene. He's a mighty hunter before the Lord, but the word before actually means right there. The word before means against. See that? So when it says Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord, he was a mighty hunter against the Lord. So Nimrod was God's enemy. Follow that? Now Nimrod started the kingdom. What was the kingdom called? It's called Babel, right? Now I want you to watch this. Dealing with the history of Babel, Let's notice once again, you see Satan's plan. Here it is. The Bible says in Genesis 11, and they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Now look at the motive of why they wanted to build the city. It says, and let us, notice this, and let us make us a name. So notice that. We're going to build the city for the purpose of doing what? Make us a name. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech." So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. I want you to catch what's happening. The Bible makes it very clear. We need to understand Satan's devices if you're going to win the war. In the beginning of time, Satan himself fell, and it was because of pride, self-exaltation. It was foundational to his fall. Well, he gets kicked out of heaven, so now he comes down to God's children, and he's now trying to fulfill his original desire through his children. So he says, why don't you disobey God? Because if you do it, you'll become like him, which is exactly what he wanted. So here it is, they fell for it, sin comes into the world. Now there's all these kingdoms getting set up, and when Nimrod sets up his kingdom, which is called Babel, which is very, very important to us, because in these last moments of earth's history, we know that part of the war that we're in is going to reach its climax with an organization called Babylon. So this is not old truth. This is not past truth. This is present truth, what we're studying. And so what God wants us to understand is, well, as we look at the very foundation of Babylon, that last group that we're going to be at war with, the foundation of Babylon is self-exaltation. Here we go again. When it says make us a name, Literally, if you look up that term, make us a name, there goes a Hebrew word right there. What did they mean when they said, let us make us a name? It says, as a mark or memorial of individuality, honor, authority, to become renowned. That's what they wanted. They wanted to exalt themselves. Well, this is interesting. Because as we begin to fast forward through the time of Babylon, we're going to see something. You see, instead, rather than humbling themselves and repenting, 
They prefer to preserve their lives on their own and then make it a legacy for other generations to behold that upon their own merits they were able to save themselves. This is the foundation of Babylon. The foundation of Babylon. We saved ourselves. Look at what we did. That's the foundation of Babylon. Now here it is, the Bible says the absolute opposite. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Rather than them humbling themselves and repenting of their sins, they came up with a plan that did not involve humility. But it involved salvation. They wanted to save themselves through self-exaltation rather than be saved through humbling themselves before God. This is foundational to this institute called Babylon. You start to see this thing unfold because when you look at the fall of Babylon in the literal sense, the literal kingdom, when you think of none other than Nebuchadnezzar, how can we forget? Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Literally, they were saying, Nebuchadnezzar, humble yourself before God. Break off your sins by righteousness. Confess your sins, acknowledge it. Humble yourself before God. Nebuchadnezzar hears the admonishment, but the Bible is very clear he did not pay attention. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? I mean, totally missed the message. All it took was 12 months. Missed the message. He forgot the graces of God. You ever did that before? When you were in your trial, oh Lord, I'll humble myself a thousand times over. God delivers you, and all of a sudden, in a matter of months, we forget the hand of God and how he moved on our behalf. It's an old problem. And so it is that as we see that, the Bible says, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. Well, here it is that as a result of that, we know Nebuchadnezzar went through seven years of absolute turmoil, punishment, and judgment. But thank the Lord he came out of it. It wasn't the close of his life. Thank the Lord. And so it is that Nebuchadnezzar, as he sobered up, it says, and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride he is able to abase nebuchadnezzar makes it very clear why he fell it was because of pride thank god he repented before destruction well here it is that once again we're just watching this plan of satan unfold through and through and through now watch this when, unfortunately, it came to Nebuchadnezzar's son, we know that there was a problem. In Daniel 5, it says, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. And Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. He wanted to have an orgy with God's holy vessels well here it is that it goes on to say then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of god which was at jerusalem and the king and his princes his wives and his concubines drank in them they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver of brass of iron of wood and of stone in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. And what did it say? And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart. And though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself 
against the Lord of heaven. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Let us go to the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter. In the last gospel herald to be given to the world, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, the 14th chapter, the last gospel herald, again, starting from the beginning of our message, we learned that the apostle Paul was a mighty warrior for the Lord. And one of the reasons why Paul was so mighty and so powerful for God was not only because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, his deep, studious life, his strong prayer life. In addition to all of those facts, Paul told us one of the reasons why he was victorious. It said in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, he was not ignorant of Satan's devices. We saw that Jesus himself said no king goes to a war without understanding his enemy. And we acknowledge the fact that we are in a war. Therefore, we need to understand our enemy. And one of the things that God wants to reveal to us about our enemy is the foundation of his movements. And so it is that the Bible made it clear. Pride always comes before a fall that leads to destruction. And so it is that when we looked at the Bible, we saw the first fall that ever took place in the existence of God's creation was none other than that being called Lucifer himself. He fell. And how did he fall? He fell on the point of pride, which was self-exaltation, taking the place of God. As a result of losing that battle in heaven, the Bible says, okay, heaven, you can rejoice because he's gone. But those of you on earth, woe unto you. We watched his plan unfold where he came to Eve and he tried to fulfill his desires through her. Exalt yourself above God and his word and you will be blessed. Then he did it through kingdoms, starting with the foundation of Babel, which was Nimrod, all the way through to Nebuchadnezzar and then finally Belshazzar. But the Bible says in Revelation 14 and verse 8, that second angel's message, it says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made how many nations? She made, think about that. She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So that means that Babylon is distributing some type of inebriating product to everybody on earth. Yes, it does produce lies and deception, but the foundation of it is the same exact thing that we've been studying. And so let's notice it. When we deal with the fall of Babylon spiritual, pay attention. And there followed another angel saying Babylon is what? Fallen is fallen. Now, Babylon cannot fall unless what comes first? Pride. So that means that pride is the foundation of not only literal Babylon, Pride is the foundation of spiritual Babylon because it can't fall except there be what? Pride first because pride comes before a fall. Now watch this. When it says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. My friends, go to Revelation 17. Watch the verses carefully. We're going to go to Revelation 17. Notice, we're establishing all these points because if we miss this point, we could be fighting while we're beating the air and losing the battle. In Revelation, the 17th chapter, notice what the Bible says now. Revelation, we're looking at the 17th chapter, and we're going to consider verses 1 to 5. I'll go ahead and read verse 1. You'll do verse 2. I'll do 3. You'll do 4, and we'll take it to verse 5. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, and there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Which 
So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, we know that this is not speaking in a literal sense. This is speaking in a spiritual sense. So now we know that there's a, scene, there's a great horror on the scene called Babylon the Great, and she has many, many daughters. Now watch chapter 18, and let's look at verses 1 through 5, and then verse 7. Let's notice, in chapter 18, starting at verse 1, again, I will start at verse 1, you'll do 2, and we'll take it down. In Revelation 18 and verse 1, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Verse 7 together. How much she did what? Glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. What was the foundation of Babylon that merited all the judgments of God? Pride. Again, Self-exaltation. You know, nine times out of ten, when we talk about Babylon and her wine, we think about doctrines, don't we? We, watch my words very carefully, we limit it to doctrines. But not God. God, open face in the scripture, told us the foundation of what even produced those foul doctrines. She glorified herself. This is the foundation of the sins that reached unto heaven that God ultimately said, come out of her, she is irreparable. My brothers and my sisters, what God is trying to get across to you and get across to me is that from the beginning of time all the way down to literally the end of time, the great battle is going to be even amongst God's people, the pride of Satan versus the humility of Christ reigning in the heart. And the question is, which one do you have? Is it the pride of Satan or is it the humility of Christ? You know why this is very important for us to understand? You see, we are believers in the everlasting gospel, aren't we? Do we believe in the everlasting gospel? Amen. Amen. We believe not only in the first, not only in the second, but we also believe in the third angel's message. Isn't that right? Well, let me let you know something that came from that very testimony of Jesus, that spirit of prophecy, in relation to those who believe the third angel's message. Notice the quote and be in a prayerful state of mind. As the storm approaches, a what kind of class? Not a small, a large class who have professed faith in what? In the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth. What do they do? They abandon their position and then join the ranks of the Now, hold up. Wait a second. Who's the opposition? No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Satan is foundational. But what is the earthly opposition that they join? That's Babylon. 
That is Babylon. Notice what it says. But have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position, and join the ranks of the opposition. And what ends up happening? They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. That means that there's people right now that are talking third angel's message. <laughs> Real talk. There are some people right now that are talking third angel's message. They have a problem. They're not allowing God to sanctify them through obeying all of his truth. If this process continues, the words of inspiration are clear. We will eventually abandon position. You see, you remember how I started our message? Remember I told you that startling statement Jesus said? You are of your father, the devil. How can the devil become your father? Very simple, when God is not. You understand that? Remember that? And what did he say? He said, you are of your father, the devil. And if the devil's our father, what did Jesus say? He said, the lust of your father you might do. He said, the lust of your father you will do. You understand that? Now, why is that so important to us? Because, my brothers and sisters, God wants us to understand. Listen, Peter said, Lord, I'll never deny you. Peter was sure, but he did not know himself. Peter had an evil spirit of pride that was still in his heart. And when, listen to my words carefully, when the crisis came, the talker, man, listen, y'all don't understand how much of a privilege it is to be alive at such a time as this. I'm talking about me. I'm supposed to be dead. But I'm alive. God spared my life, and he allowed a transition to happen in my mind that I get to go all over the world and give them another principle of the gospel that I did not do as effectively in my previous ministry. I am so thankful that God spared my life, that I can honor him by sharing what's very, very important for his people at such a time as this. Peter was sure. There's a lot of people on YouTube right now, don't they sound just like Peter? You can pick the YouTube video and you can listen to the so-called tough guys and tough girls that are hiding behind those cameras and talking all sorts of present truth jargon. You can go to Audioverse and you can go to 3ABN and you can go to Hope Channel and you can go to whatever place you want to go. And there's all sorts of people that look like tough warriors, like they're just going to be faithful until the end, forgetting what God has said, that many a star that we have admired for their brilliancy is going to go out in darkness. Volume 5 of the Testimonies to the Church, page 81. My friends, what God wants us to understand, you want to know who's going to make it in these last days? It's the ones who overcome pride. Amen. And you can preach present truth proudly. I speak the truth. You can keep that wicked demon in your heart while you talk about the movements of the papacy while you talk about apostate Protestantism, while you talk about the sins that are happening in the church. And that pride has gone nowhere. It's just sitting right there. Do you know this week, I'm going to show you what, pride, what, what humility looks like. I'm going to show you biblically, this is humility. Man, I can't wait to do this. I, it's almost like, you know, I wish I could just zzz, zzz, and you just forward all the other meetings and get to the next part. But y'all got other blessings coming. Amen. Amen. You got other blessings coming, but I, I can't wait to get back here with you. Seriously, God has given the message, and I want to give it to you. And I pray that God will deliver us from that thing right there, pride. Pride. Pride is arrogancy. It's pomp. It's a swelling. It's a constant lifting up of oneself. 
But do you know what Jesus gave us to overcome this wicked thing, this, this, this very wicked demon? Do you know what Jesus gave us to help us overcome pride? He gave us some true education. You want to know the education? Go to Matthew 11. I'm getting ready to wind it down here. I want to give you a couple more points, and I'm going to let you go. In Matthew, the 11th chapter, Jesus gave us something that will help us with this. I'm just so thankful that God has, has helped me see this now. For some reason, I couldn't see it before. It's amazing. It's amazing how the heart is so deceitful. It's, it's blind. I mean, literally, I, I thought I understood this. And for me, it required open heart surgery so God could get my attention. That's what it required for me. I'm certainly not saying that for you. I don't recommend it. But at the same time, I'm like, Lord, do what you got to do to get your people's attention. Because some of us, I mean, are granite rock hard-headed. I mean, we don't listen. And God sends all these loving warnings. It's like he just says, I, I need you. Hey, we need to talk about that. And we keep saying, in a, in a little bit, Lord, I'll, I'll get to that. God's like, listen, you can't, you can't keep having these problems in your home. You can't keep having these problems with your family, your children, your wife. These husbands and wives right now that are literally estranged to each other will not reconcile. Notice what I said, will not, meaning they could, but the sacrifice is too deep. And they will not reconcile with each other. And the chief reason that is not happening is because of that wicked thing called pride. But they actually have the nerve to come to church and to sing when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. While pride is sitting right there, reclined and very comfortable. And we think that we're going to make it to heaven like this. Talk about the heart being deceitful. There are some of us that you know there are people who have offended you and you have not, as Matthew 18, verse 35 says, you have not forgiven them from your heart. We live by this, I forgive you, but I'm not going to forget. Boy, what if God did that with us, right? And we start, you know, acting certain ways that God says, I've given you power. To, you don't have to act that way towards that person. Nah, Lord, after what they did to me, mm -mm, their probation has closed. And God says, really? Is that right? So you're going to keep coming to church, and you're going to sing the praises of Jehovah, and you're going to let pride sit right in your heart, and you actually think that I'm going to save you like that. That's how wicked our hearts are. Very deceitful. Above all things. And so what does Jesus say? Jesus says, I need to cure that. And the only way that he can cure that demon called pride is through the true education of Matthew 11. What does the Bible say in Matthew 11? The Bible says in Matthew 11, right there in verse 28, he says, come unto me, all ye, how many? All, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And what does he promise to give? And I'll give you rest. Then he says, how? He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I don't want you to lose that part. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. What does Jesus want us to learn about him? He says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and by this you shall find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. If you're carrying a burden that you say, Lord, this burden is so heavy, then one thing we know for sure, God did not give it to you. Isn't that beautiful? Some of you can get free tonight. Some of you are carrying burdens right now and it feels like it's just crushing you to death. Jesus says, I didn't give you that burden. The Bible is very clear. My burdens are light. It's when we try to carry it on our own that's our crisis. We're back to Babylon. We're back to Genesis 11. Let us make us a name that we can become renowned. Let us do it on our own. Let's save ourselves on our own. Why do you keep trying to solve your own problems? Are you aware that you cannot love people? 
I mean, did you get that straight in your head yet? Or do you actually think you can love people on your own? The kind of love that you have, I don't want it. The kind of love that I have, naturally, you should not want it. The Bible's very clear. Love them as I have loved you. That's the only acceptable love. Not this conditional, multi-layered standard that we create in our own minds of what love is. You can't love people. And I can't either. Without Jesus, truly, we can do nothing. And you got to believe that. We go around saying, oh, I got peace. I'm good. I got peace. Yeah, that's your peace. Jesus says, I don't leave peace like the world gives. He says, my peace is of a whole different nature. You don't want the fruit of your spirit. You want the fruit of the spirit. And so Jesus says, the only way you can learn this, you got to learn of me. You got to study my life. And what does Jesus specifically want us to study? He says, study my meekness and my lowliness in heart. He says, that's what I want you to study. You see, I don't know if you're aware of it. I told a young man the other day, Brother Lemmy, he said, man, it's so hard being in ministry. It's so hard. To, how do you do this in ministry? I said, yes, yeah. in ministry would be easy, man, if you didn't have to deal with people. <laughs> That's what I told him. I said, man, ministry would be so much easier if we just didn't have to deal with people. But God is too wise to make a mistake. God brings people in contact with each other because he knows that's the best way to purify the heart. Because sometimes I could stare in the mirror and I could look at me and be like, man, I am a great guy. I'm just phenomenal. I mean, I could say that all day long in the mirror. But then when I say that to my wife, my wife's going to say, well, I do love you in spite of. You understand? She's going to give me that reality check. She's going to give me that reason that I need to stay on my knees. My four gifts from God, Jared, Kayla, Caleb, Jada, my four precious children. As of November this year, 18, 19, 20, 21. Four adults in my home. I remember the days. My children remind me, Daddy, you still need more of Jesus to perfect your character. I have a church that I serve as an elder I have a ministry where I travel all over this planet and I'm always dealing with people and I'm always reminded there's more of Jesus that I must still learn. God designed to deliver us from ourselves by bringing us in contact with people. That's why God does not endorse monks and nuns in being hermits. That's not God's plan. You don't disassociate from people to learn holiness. It is in the midst of mingling with people that you learn your need for holiness. And Jesus says, and when you mingle with the people, he says, learn of me. Study my meekness. Study my humility. And he says, and I want you to look at it, and I want you to behold it so much that by beholding, you become changed. Do you know the remaining four sessions? All we're going to study is how the humility and meekness of Christ applied in the life gives us victory over the foundation to the many sins that we commit. Amen. Do you know that that's all we're going to study for the next four sessions? That's it. I have nothing else to give you. That's all I got because I'm tired. I'm tired of all these so-called present truth preachers talking all this stuff and they don't show the people how to live. They don't help the people know how to live. Don't tell me about I need victory over sin before probation closes, but you don't spell out what victory over sin looks like when I'm dealing with my wife. 
when I'm dealing with my children, when I go to my job or my business and I got to deal with all sorts of characters. What does victory over sin look like in those interactions? This is what we need. I lie to you not. This is what we need. God has, I mean, he has exploded that thing in my mind. Son, they're talking too much theory. A gospel that's not practical is a worthless gospel. I want to show you how by the grace of God, you can overcome pride. But I'm giving you the source already. It's only going to come. Meekness, lowliness of Christ. And I'm going to show you in this last section right here, little portion right here, I'm going to show you how this is a last day message. Because, you know, I, I mean, I meet some strange people. They actually say, Brother Lemon, that's not present truth. I said, so meekness and lowliness of Jesus is not present truth? Really? Yeah, man, you didn't say anything about the Sunday law. I'm like, bro, listen, I'm showing people how to get ready for the Sunday law. I know that what I'm about to show you right here, this is the preparation for the final crisis. You don't get this, you're going to be part of that great controversy 608 group. You're going to be like Peter. You're going to think you're strong and ready to stand for the Lord. And when the storm comes, you'll be surprised like Peter was. Watch this. When we think about the meekness and lowliness of Christ, I want to show you this. I mean, when I, when I see that Jesus is our example, boy, do I mean this. Go to 1 Peter 2. These are our last verses, and then we'll bring it to a close. 1 Peter 2. Jesus is our example. I want you to see what meekness is. Because this is what we're going to have to study. We're going to study this uh, throughout our time together during this camp meeting. This is what we're going to be studying. So 1 Peter 2, 19 through 24. When you get there, say amen. amen. Now watch this. The meekness of Christ. This is a beautiful part right here. It says, verse 19, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Now watch. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us something. What did he leave us? He left us an example. Amen. That you should follow his steps. Now watch. Who did no sin, and neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, what did he do? He reviled not again. When he suffered, what did he do? He didn't even so much as give a threat, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. You literally just looked at the meekness of Christ. Doing well in the midst of suffering wrongfully. That's meekness. Doing well in the midst of suffering wrongfully. That's the meekness of Christ. Now, the reason why this is so important is because, did you see that beautiful description in verse 22? It says, he did no sin and neither was Guile found in his mouth. You know why I know this example of the meekness of Christ is a last day message? Keep your finger here. Go to Revelation 14. Do you remember in Revelation 14? You see, and when we go to Revelation 14, we often think about, you know, 6 through 12. I get that. But we're not going there right now. We're going to Revelation 14, 4 and 5. In Revelation 14, verses 4 and 5, remember, the example of Christ did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. This is a demonstration of his meekness. In the midst of suffering, he did no sin. No deceit was in his mouth. He continued to do well. When he was done wrong, he never gave it back. He never gave it back. When he was done wrong, he didn't even threaten anybody. If you do this to me one more time, I will do. Jesus never even did that. Talking about 
meekness, doing well in the midst of suffering wrongfully. What does it say in Revelation 14, 4 and 5? Good news. It says, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found what? No guile. So notice that. No guile in Jesus' mouth. In these last day people, no guile in their mouth. Then it says in verse 5, concluding, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The only way you can be without fault is if God keeps you from falling into sin. Jude verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. So literally, these last day people have somehow learned of Jesus. They're reflecting his meekness. How's it going with you? How are you doing with that? When you're reviled, do you revile again? And I, I'm not talking about that one or two days or one or two weeks or one or two months. Is it your lifestyle that when you're reviled, you do not revile again? That when people do you wrong, not even a threat comes out of your mouth. Your demonstration of Christ remains consistent in the midst of a people who are inconsistent. How are you doing with that? How am I doing with that? This is the meekness of Christ, continuing to do well in the midst of suffering wrongfully. That's a meek man. That's a meek woman. They continue to do the right thing when even their own husband does the wrong thing, when even their own wife does the wrong thing. They continue doing the right thing. Boy, you find a home like that, I guarantee you, you're finding a wife or a husband after God's order. But that is the meekness of Christ. Philippians 2, 1 through 4, our last verse, and I'll let you go. In Philippians 2, verses 1 to 4, what does the Bible show us? We're talking about not only his meekness, but we're also talking about humility. When we're talking about the humility of Christ, Philippians 2, 1 through 4. The Bible says in Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Here we go. But in what? Lowliness of what? Lowliness of mind. So this lowliness is not an outward acting that's not in harmony with our heart. Are you following that? This lowliness... This humility is a humility that comes from the heart. Are you following that? Okay, but it says, but in lowliness of mind, what are we doing? We are esteeming others, what? Better than ourselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That is the lowliness, the humility of Christ, putting others before yourself, giving them your best, putting others before you, esteeming them better than you, and it will show in your service in how you treat them and deal with them. I remember my wife and I went to a home. This only happened once, and I don't say this uh, to you know, because this is on the internet or whatever, you know, I'm sure there are people watching me who housed me and my family. So I want to make it very clear that this is not something that my wife and I ever used as an occasion of judgment towards anyone. We really don't. But there was something that struck my wife and I, and it only happened once. We have traveled this world, and we have been invited to many homes to stay with people. 
And usually when you go into a home, what usually happens is there's a guest room. You know, you get a guest room, you get put in the guest room somewhere. No problem. But one day we came to a home. And when we came to this home, it was a fairly small home, but there was like a, a bedroom set up in the living room area. And then there was actually one bedroom. And a husband and wife lived there. So obviously, walking through the house, I saw a room, and then I saw another area where the bed was, and I said to myself, okay, this is where my wife and I are going to stay. No problem. But as I put my bag down, the husband said, no, 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 Brother Lemon, you're not staying here. I said, oh, okay. And I said, oh, must be another room that I'm aware of, you know, like a bat cave somewhere. Just to press a button, and the door opens up, and they go, oh, there goes the other room. I, I, didn't, I mean, I was just thinking like, you know, there's got to be another room somewhere that I'm just not aware of. He says, no, no, no. He says, come. And he walks us and he says, this is our room. He says, but while you're here, you are our preferred guest. You will take our room. It was a very nice room, private, had its own bathroom, everything. He said, this is your room. I said, well, where are you and your wife going? He says, no, no we, we'll be sleeping in the other room. And my wife and I, later on that evening, was like, we've never had anybody do that before. <laughs> they gave up the better room. They gave us their king bed and nice room, plush carpet, privacy, comfort. And they took the couch that flips out as a bed and the bars, you can sometimes feel it through the mattress. You know, they, they took that bed. I was ready to be like, okay, you know, this is normal. We the guests, we take the bar bed. But no, he said, no. Mm -mm. He said, no one comes to our house. Whoever comes to our home, they get the best. They get the best of what we can give. And that left a very deep impression on my heart from many years ago lowliness. I will give you the better, and I'll take the worse, because I esteem you better than myself from the heart. Anyone who learns this lesson of the meekness and lowliness of Christ, I can guarantee you they will be part of God's team that will go through the final crisis and finish the work. Because we just saw through the prophetic lens, the 144,000, they learned it. They learned it. So this is a last day message. This is what God wants us to experience. And by his grace, we must experience it. And so my question to you is very simple. If you know that Satan's plan, you see, remember, we, we discovered his wiles. We're not ignorant. We understand what he's trying to do. Satan doesn't care how much you preach. He doesn't care how much books you give out. He doesn't care if you are a canvasser. He doesn't care if you're a so-called medical missionary. He does not care if you are an end-time preacher. He doesn't care about any of that. He's not afraid of you, and he is not threatened as long as that pride can recline in the heart. Satan says, I already got you. Go preach. Go teach. And in your preaching, teaching, and canvassing, he'll let you know, man, nobody preaches it like you. Nobody does it like how you do it. He'll make you sit down and listen to a sermon, and, and he'll put thoughts in your mind like, you know, if that was you preaching, you could have said it like this. The devil does this stuff all the time. And we play with that. We fluff that pillow. Her hair is not as pretty as mine. Her outfit is not as nice as mine. Satan gives us a thousand reasons to exalt ourselves because that's his wiles. Preach the truth. Just keep the pride where it is. And so my appeal is very simple. If you know you're a victim of pride, if you know that it's alive in your heart, and you have not received that true education from Jesus yet. You haven't learned the meekness and the lowliness. But you're saying, Lord, please, 
Let me leave this camp meeting different than when I came. If that's your prayer, I'm inviting you to stand to your feet with me. And as you stand, I have no doubt that God stands with you and he will give you victory. Thank God who gives us the victory through our Lord, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand better the foundation of the movements of Satan. He is trying to get us even so busy in ministry and finishing the work that we do nothing about that wicked demon of pride that exists in our hearts. And Lord, there's no way that you can save us and most certainly you cannot use us in the true finishing of your work if we do not learn of Jesus, his meekness and lowliness. My hope and my prayer is that you will help all of us to receive this within our hearts. Truly we pray, open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your law. And we thank you, dear God, that you are still willing to forgive us for our self-exaltations. Please help us through the power of your Holy Spirit to truly receive the meekness and lowliness of Jesus. For this is our prayer that we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.